welcome to this India Today special. As the world and India reel under the impact of the coronavirus, the future for the global and Indian economy looks increasingly uncertain. To make sense of these uncertain times, I'm joined by a very special guest. Please welcome Ruchi Sharma, best-selling author and global strategist and investor based in New York, one of the world's most respected voices. Appreciate your joining us, Ruchi. Thanks, Ranjit. Here on India Today. The most obvious question, right. how bad is the corona impact going to be on India and the world economy? Will it get a lot worse as some fear? Right. So let's just put this in perspective. And this situation is changing very quickly. The early estimates suggest that the global economy this year will contract by 1%. This is the early estimates that are coming in from the various research houses. Now, to put this in perspective, the last time the global economy contracted was in the 2008-2009 global recession by a similar magnitude. So you already, given the damage that's been done in the last few weeks, you're already pricing in something very similar to what happened in the 2008-2009 global financial crisis. There have been about seven global recessions over the last century. And it is very rare for the global economy as such to contract. Because there are always countries like China, India, which register some positive growth rate. So this is the unprecedented nature of the shock. Now, people are expecting a 1% contraction, assuming that activity begins to resume some sort of a normal path by May or so of this year. If that does not happen, we're looking then for the worst global recession since the Great Depression. That is the sort of scenario that we're looking at. At the very least, what people are looking for now is that the global economy suffers the similar kind of recession it suffered in the 2008-2009 global financial crisis. If this pandemic rolls on and you don't get it under control over the next month or so, which allows some activity to come back to normal in early summer, May, June for the world, then we're looking for something which is far greater and the only parallel then will be the Great Depression. You're saying that if this pandemic goes beyond the summer, yeah. then we are looking at a situation not unlike the 1930s Great Depression. Yeah, I'm saying that's that is the, depressing news. Yeah, but uh, that's just the reality. That's the scenario because I'm saying that we have already, and this is the fastest that ever it's happened. Even the global financial crisis, the first cracks appeared in late 2007, early 2008. It sort of rolled over and then you had September, October of that year where there was a complete bloodbath. This time it's just a complete shock that till mid-February, hardly anybody was even moving the global growth estimates based on what was happening out here. And then all of a sudden, we have gone from that within a month to now pricing in a recession of that magnitude. And that shows up in the stock markets too. The stock markets, if you look at the US stock market, again, you have to go back to the 1929 crash to come across a, a period where the stock market has fallen so quickly over such a short span of time. The typical bear market in the US where the stock market falls by 30%, happens over 15 months. This time, we have seen a 32% decline in 18 days. That has just never happened before, even during the global financial crisis. You did not see something as precipitous as that. The most extreme scenario, in a way, uh, Ruchir, has been drawn by Bloomberg Economics, suggesting that a total of $2.7 trillion in lost output Recession in the US, in Europe, the slowest growth on record in China. And this is assuming that the outbreak continues to plague the world through a good part of 2020. So you're suggesting, much like this report, that we have to, in that sense, prepare for the worst. Yeah. While we hope for the best. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's what governments are doing now, that the mantra has become whatever it takes. You throw the entire kitchen sink at this problem. But here is where the world is getting a bit split between the haves and the have-nots, which is there are some governments that have the capacity to try and do this. The United States being the principal one, where they're thinking about a stimulus, which is about 5% of GDP. And that's the direct stimulus in terms of direct benefits that consumers and companies will get and a lot of indirect guarantees on top of that. But the problem is that in countries like India is that we just don't have the ability to be able to spend anywhere close to that if you're required to. Because, you know, in 2008-9, after the global contagion, there was a fiscal stimulus in India as well. There's pressure on the government to come up with an economic package to try and 
help those at the bottom of the pyramid in a way, the small industries which are really bleeding already. Is your, are you saying that we don't have the fiscal headroom that we had in 2008-9? Absolutely, because then the revenue numbers were very different, the deficit numbers were very different because we just come off an incredible boom, uh, a global boom which had helped uh, things up. And of course we went ahead and did a massive stimulus and the mistake we made then, as I think is widely agreed, that we kept the stimulus in action for far too long. But there was a stimulus, I think, it was about 2% of GDP or slightly more than 2% of GDP, the direct stimulus, apart from the indirect stimulus of helping the banks and giving uh, some direct lending. That was the direct stimulus. I just don't think that we have the ability to, to do that today. If we do do that, you will require some of the deficit to be monetized, which is the RPI to be able to help you do that. And then you're dealing with a very different scenario. You're dealing with a scenario where the rupee then will have to take a very big hit if the RBI is forced to monetize. In today's day and age, if you give the sense to the market that that's the kind of thing that you're looking at, we could see a very sharp fall in the rupee quite quickly. So it's a very fine balance with what this government has to do, which is, yes, if you, you need some sort of action to help companies, but you try and do too big a stimulus and that leads to more concerns about the deficit, you are going to see a big sort of move on the rupee if that happens. So in a sense, we are in an even more difficult position in 2020 than we were in 2008. Undoubtedly, because we are entering this with the, with the economy already in a severe sort of slowdown. In 2008, it was a global slowdown and the, uh, the Indian economy had participated fully or more than fully in the global boom that preceded it. So this is a very different situation today. Let me for a moment turn to the country where it all started. Right. You know, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD, says the slowdown in manufacturing in China due to COVID-19 could cause a $50 billion disruption in trade and the impact on India alone could be $348 million. Is one of the crises issues the fact that China today contributes almost 19% uh, to the global economy and if China contracts, yeah. the world suffers severe disruption. Yeah, we've already seen that. So China in many ways has been the trailer for what's going on. So look at the China and this is why I think that the markets panicked because uh, last Monday we got the data out of China that in January, February, because China was the first country to suffer the impacts of it, what were the economic consequences of what happened in China? And the data was staggering which is that people expected retail sales, fixed investment, to contract by 4%, 5% in the first couple of months. They were down 20%. So the Chinese economy in the first quarter, the best estimates I've seen, is expected to contract by at least 5% or so. These are the estimates that I'm seeing. The Chinese economy in the last 40 years has possibly never contracted ever since it started opening up to the world. So this is how unprecedented it is that the Chinese economy is likely to contract in the first quarter of this year. And the full year estimates for Chinese growth, this is again assuming that now activity in China is resuming to normal as you know. So in fact, yes. the one bright spot that everybody points out to in the world today is China, just because of the way that the Chinese economy has been able to come back and how activity is limping back to normal that the Chinese economy for this year, assuming there are no big global knock-on effects, is expected to grow by maybe one and a half, two percent, the Chinese economy for the mm -hmm. entire year. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for China maybe grow by one and a half, two percent. We're looking for US, Europe to all contract. In that environment, it's so hard to know as to what the Indian economy is going to grow, if at all. I mean, this is going to be a scenario where getting any growth rate is going to be fortunate if the global economy is going to contract by 1%, China is going to grow at barely 2%. I think that's, and this is all assuming that the pandemic peaks in, let's say, May or so. If it doesn't peak in the next month or so, uh, at least the growth rate in new cases, then even these scenarios, which are now the base case, I think, get turned into something else by then. You know, because there are those in government who continue to say 2020-21, India will grow at 6-6.5%. Uh, you seem to suggest that this is all entirely now dependent on A, how soon the pandemic comes under control, B, possibly how soon China actually recovers and, and, and pushes the world economy in a sense back on the growth part. But 6-6.5% would be at the moment living in denial. For the fiscal year? Yes. Oh yeah, I mean the chances of, of us achieve, even before, and uh, this is one of the topics that I would have said, so anyway, I'd said this at, in fact at the beginning of the year, mm -hmm. that given how the global economy was growing even before the outbreak of this pandemic, 
the probability that any country can grow much above five percent today is very low because the entire global economy has changed we people have this anchoring bias that oh we grew at seven eight percent in the 2000s and we did it uh, until 2015 as per the official data so we can continue to keep on sort of using that as the template as to when we'll go. No, the global economy has completely changed. We're in an era of deglobalization. We're in an era of incredible amount of debt and also where the demographics have changed. We are not going to be able to grow at six, seven percent, even under normal circumstances, according to me. Now, after the pandemic, I think that if the Indian economy, I have no idea in terms of what the growth rates will be, the numbers here we don't know, but there is if the Indian economy can even grow at 3%, I'd say, if China is going to grow at one and a half, two percent 2%, if you can even grow at 3 I think that will be a miracle enough given what's going on. So let's not get lost in terms of what uh, the government says and what the numbers say. There is just no way we're going to be able to grow at these growth rates, even if the pandemic hadn't broken out. And now that it's broken out, I think that 3 4% will be a miracle to achieve in this scenario. You know, Ruchit, there, is, there are some who suggest there's an opportunity that India could become the manufacturing and supply hub for inputs for those global companies that are looking at options to China. You know, set up SEZs across the country. This is the time to give benefits and try and find ways to emerge as an alternative hub. Is that possible? Yeah, that's, I think, this era of deglobalization first is going to continue. So I think you have to understand that the pie is going to be smaller because in the era of deglobalization, the number of companies in general that will want to set up offshore facilities is going to be much more limited. And then even the traditional model of exporting away to prosperity, where all these uh, miracle economies from Japan, Korea, Taiwan, China, Singapore, they were all able to export their way to prosperity. That option now has been curtailed just because you've got protectionist measures coming up everywhere. So let's be clear, the pie is smaller. Now within that pie, can we get a bigger share? Yeah, we could get a bigger share because I think uh, whatever factories people set up, Nobody wants to set up three factories in China anymore. At best, you do one in China, one in Vietnam, and one maybe in a Bangladesh or India. I think that's the thinking that's there. So yeah, I think that is the opportunity for the next five years. The immediate problem we have to deal with is the fact that the global economy is sinking very quickly. We have a global recession baked in. That is, uh, that is undeniable. A global recession baked in. Oh yeah, in terms of the fact that we're going to have a global recession this year, I think is, 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 a, is now a certainty. Now, the issue is what the magnitude will be, what is the right reference point. But the fact that we're going to have a global recession of a similar magnitude as the global financial crisis of 2008, 2009, I think is now the base case until some absolute miracle happens in the next week or two and the clouds lift over this entire pandemic. Where does India stand relative to some of the other emerging market economies that you just mentioned, the Vietnams, the Indonesias, the Thailands? Are we in a better place than them? So far, I think that, so there are two things going on. That one, yes, given our more limited exposure to global trade and also to China, you can argue that some of the impact is a bit less. Even things like tourism. There are economies like Thailand in the region which are com getting completely ravaged because they're so dependent on tourism. So the fact that we are a bit more domestic oriented, a slightly more insular than these economies, does offer you less in terms of the direct growth impact. But that's where the good news ends. The bad news, as I said, is that our ability to respond to this crisis is very limited compared to many governments, given our starting point on the fiscal situation. The fact that you're being forced to raise excise duties on oil and other products at this stage, even as those prices are collapsing, just tells you about where the government finances are uh, currently. You know, the other X factor in this crisis, the country where you spend a lot of your time, the United States. Yeah. You know, some worst case scenarios see the US economy going down to 0.5%, something that you seem to agree with. No, no. It could, you know, it'll contract. Negative growth rate. Yeah, negative contract. growth rate. Yeah. Many suggest negative growth rate. Yeah. Is that therefore the big variable? How quickly does the US economy recover? There's the Chinese economy yeah. and there's the US economy. Right. And I think that this is where the scenarios become very dynamic because the single most important statistic that everyone is focusing on in the United States, in Italy and, and globally, is when does the growth rate of the new cases mm -hmm. peak? The growth rate of the new cases, this is a bit complicated, it's not just the new cases, but the growth rate. That peaked in China in about mid-February, about you know, two months after the, the outbreak of the disease yes, out there. After 
taking massive draconian measures that it peaked in about two months or so. So now you're hoping that this thing in the United States too, it, that you need to see a peak in that in the next month or so. If you don't see a peak in that in the next month or so, then I think that you're looking at much more dire scenarios. So yeah, the variable is undoubtedly the United States, but it's also how it's spreading globally. Because look mm -hmm. at what's happening in Europe, that, it's, that Italy is at the epicenter of it, but Germany, UK, the, uh, it's coming in waves, and that's what's you know, creating this entire uncertainty about the global economy. In India, too, we are all anxiously waiting for what happens next week. That is, there, right. are there any signs of community transfer or not? And that's going to determine so much on this. There are so many theories about these things. So I think the problem with this is coming in waves. There's no sort of, you know, even as China has sorted it out, Korea seems to be sorting it out. It just keeps coming in waves in Europe, in US. Now we're looking in India as to what the effect is going to be. So far, the numbers look okay compared to the rest of the world, but we don't know what the uh, testing is. So I think that it's coming in waves and this has to dissipate. But yeah, undoubtedly that how the US economy does determines on this one single important variable that everybody in the world today is tracking. When does the growth rate in the new cases peak? What we are also seeing in all these countries, many of which you mentioned, US, all the European countries, Canada, Australia, Germany, France, governments announcing major relief packages. You know, a kind of safety net for those who are worst affected, tax breaks, cash handouts. Is that going to be the response of, of the world? Is that the only response at the moment that the world has to this? You know, in the history of the United States, this has never happened that I can remember. The most important date after Christmas, which doesn't change, is April 15th, which is the filing of your tax returns. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is sacrosanct. They have pushed that back, as you know. Mm -hmm. So what you're seeing is an incredible amount of flexibility on part of governments and a lot of trial and error too in terms of what works, what doesn't work because one is the direct amount of stimulus you give. Two is that how do you prevent a financial crisis because remember what's happened out here that you have all these companies sitting on record levels of debt and all of a sudden your cash flows disappear and your uh, scope for financing the debt, going back to the market, getting more debt to keep on going is very limited. So the data that I sort of have quoted in my past writings is that in the United States, 16% of companies are defined as zombie companies. So these are companies that don't even earn enough cash flow to pay their interest. So they're constantly forced to go to the market to keep refinancing. And as long as the market was open, you were able to do that. On top of that, you have a whole bunch of companies where the cash flow is just about enough to pay your interest payments, the cash flow disappears. Now, all of a sudden, they become zombies in uh, a very short span of time. This is unprecedented that, uh, that you have so many zombie companies in the world. In India, I don't have a comparable data set that the BIS has done, but the best data that I've seen from uh, some of the investment houses, such as uh, Credit Suisse, show that the comparable number for India is about 18%. 18% of Indian companies could be zombie companies. Yes. Uh, because, you know, I, I read your piece on zombie companies and, you know, you said that many of them could collapse. Uh, like in 2008, uh, 2008, it was the subprime crisis. But yeah. now you're looking at an even major, uh, a bigger challenge. Are we suggesting that a number of Indian companies, possibly 18% of our companies, could actually go belly up or be in a serious crisis? with potential job losses as a result? Yeah, so in terms of, unless they are helped out in some way. So this is one of the things that the RBI is discussing, much more regulatory forbearance, how do you not recognize bad loans, how do you push that out, uh, get easier on terms. So yeah, so th that tells you about the vulnerability of the global financial system, including in India, that in 16% uh, is the number which I know is reliably done for the United States by the Bank of International Settlements. And 18% is the number I've read about India from some of the uh, like investment houses out here. So right. that's the magnitude of the problem. Remember, like in places like the United States, 20 years ago, that number was like 3 4%. So this number has exploded because the very low interest rates have allowed these companies to keep on going. But the moment now you have a shock to the system, refinancing is becoming a real problem. So therefore, the big risk in this uh, crisis is that this is not just an economic slowdown. If it lasts, then you end up getting a financial crisis on top of it because the recourse to financing disappears. Frightening scenarios that you're painting, uh, Ruchi. For a moment, let's look at the political impact of this. This is a presidential year in the United States. Does what has happened over the last month in the United States in particular, uh, where perhaps 
the US was caught uh, unawares or napping by the outbreak make the Trump presidency more vulnerable in any way? Yeah, the betting markets have certainly shifted. But I think that, uh, so the betting markets today really say that this is going to be an extremely tight race after sort of predicting a couple of months ago that Trump was going to run away with it. But here's the thing about the United States, which I think we sort of don't quite appreciate, just how polarized things are. So if you look at Trump's approval rating, it has moved in the narrowest band of any president in American history. It just doesn't move. Mm -hmm. So even after the incredible criticism that he's faced over the last couple of weeks for first having been in denial, for being too slow to react to the crisis, his approval ratings have gone down by maybe two points. Right? So it just is incredibly polarized. You switch on television in the United States today, and what Fox News tells you is something so different from what CNN tells you. And the bases react accordingly. Like in the, uh, the data that I keep quoting here is that for CNN, uh, more than 60% of Democrats trust CNN, only just over 20% of Republicans trust CNN. On Fox, more than 60% of Republicans trust Fox, only 22% or so of Democrats trust Fox News. So you've got two complete alternative realities. Fox is giving the image that the president is acting really well, he's acting presidential, and we need to stand behind him, and you cannot criticize him in a time like this, and you, that sounds familiar. I think that that's the sort of narrative being painted there. On CNN, it is the endless list of Trump's sort of failings. Uh, one denial after another is what they keep telecasting. So those are the two reality shows going on. The fact is, it's an incredibly polarized environment, and the odds are 50-50 because the bases just don't seem to see anything wrong or anything right with their leaders or opponents respectively. One interesting fallout possibly of uh, the coronavirus outbreak, some suggest is the rise of once again, or the, in a consolidation of the strongman populist nationalists. You know, a fresh wave of nationalism, more xenophobia, keep out the immigrants. Do you see that actually happening? That could be one potential fallout of what's happened in the last few months. Look, one of the big themes that I've written about a lot uh, in my last couple of books has been about deglobalization. I just feel that that theme gets accelerated given what's going on, that the uh, companies get more risk averse, immigration borders, yes, absolutely. So I think that is the continuing fallout and this just accelerates this. So I think that now what we have to basically do, and you know, in my previous book, I had done this characterization of ACBC. Mm -hmm. And that time, in, this is 2016, I'd spoken about BC being before crisis, being the 2008 financial crisis, and uh, AC being after crisis, ACBC uh, in terms after global financial crisis. Now I think it's going to be the same ACBC world, but AC is going to be after coronavirus, BC is going to be before coronavirus. <laughs> so it's from <laughs> very interesting, yeah. Richard, but how do you therefore see India as a country which again is seen to be run by a populist strongman in Narendra Modi? What can he potentially do in a way to, to give a sense of confidence that better times could be there on the other side of I think coronavirus? He, I think he's doing what he can. Like he's following the global playbook in terms of you know, having these measures of quarantine, social distancing. I think he well realizes the limits of these policies in a country like India, given the sort of you know, way people live. Uh, but I think that the most important decision that he'll have to make, not just him, I think leaders around the world will start have to making very soon, is the trade-off between these measures and the economic costs of doing this. Because the longer these last, the terrible it is for the economy. And I know that th this doesn't quite sound right at this juncture, but asking that question, that if you keep, uh, if you're being forced to choke the economy off, how many people are gonna fall through and don't have a social safety net you know, we think a lot about the rural poor, and we've got programs and schemes for the Kisan, for the rural poor. What about the urban poor? These are people being directly impacted by activity shutting down, the roadside stalls, the uh, uh, corner, you know, uh, uh, markets, store, exactly. Yeah. All these people being shut down, and they don't, and, and much more poor people, being, you know, and they all live together in such close uh, proximity. What's gonna happen to their future the more, the more you continue with this? So I think that this is a, policy choice that people have been forced to make going back to the Spanish flu. In fact, it's so interesting, at the time of the Spanish flu, the 1918 big episode, the US president refused to even acknowledge it, even though you had a 
devastating uh, sort of uh, outbreak and a massive scale. To put that in perspective, as you well know by now, uh, a quarter of the world's population, about 500 million people at that point in time got infected. I think 50 million died. And the US President Woodrow Wilson refused to even acknowledge that this was going on because of the fear that, that this would lead to more panic and the economic costs that it would lead to. And the US at that point in time did not have much of a social safety net. That came through after the Great Depression <clears throat> in the 1930s. So I think that that is the fear now, which is that how much do you carry on with this? What are the economic costs of this? Uh, and even the US, these debates are starting. And in India, the debates are even more pressing given the lack of social safety net, particularly for the urban poor, where I think the impact will be most severe given the shutdown and economic activity. So it's interesting that the longer you stay with the shutdown, which is necessary at one level for social distancing to control the corona outbreak, the more will be the impact on the economy. Yeah, I think that that's a very clear trade-off. It's not been just faced today, it's been faced in past pandemics. Therefore, the whole critical issue is that we just have to hope and pray that in the next three to four weeks, a month at best, this thing begins to dissipate. Because if it lasts longer than that, you're going to be forced to make some very serious and unpleasant choices that you're already being forced to do today. Sure. But then you're going to be forced to do that because if you then look at what is the economic devastation on people's lives, uh, I dare say in terms of starvation or deaths, whatever that you can have, if you continue with these kind of stuff, that's the trade-off you'll have to make then. And this is beginning to start in the US as well now. Because you know, there are those like Arvind Subramaniam, former chief economic advisor, who are saying this is a moment for multilateral institutions to step into the vacuum. If, if nation states can't do it, then the World Health Organization, the World Bank, the IMF have to step in and in a sense insulate the world from the shock of a global pandemic. Yeah, you know, you know that's the uh, that's one. Uh, if philanthropists have yeah. to come out there and and spend more in a way to protect the poor. Yeah, I think that's going to happen in India. I just hope that we don't have a great culture of philanthropy. But I think that if we see more of that in these times, in terms of that's what the rich uh, can end up doing. I think that will obviously be a very good cause to do to think much more about that rather than just how do we social distance and protect ourselves, which is important. But I think that philanthropy in this time is going to be very critical. Yeah. Ruchi, you're speaking about a market meltdown globally, but what about the Indian context where, you know, there's this growing sense of anxiety over what tomorrow will bring in the markets? Right. So just put this in perspective as far as India is concerned, that the market's down just over 30% uh, in this episode. What is really shocking is the pace of the decline, just like what's happened in the US. Because in any year in India's stock market history, we typically always have a correction of around 20% plus. The fact that we've had more than 30% is extraordinary. I think there have only been about four to five years in India's stock market history that we have had a decline of this magnitude in any year. But here is the data which sort of is both comforting and also disconcerting. The Indian stock market today in dollar terms or in inflation adjusted terms is well below its 2007 high before the global financial crisis. So this has been a completely lost decade, if not more, for the Indian stock market. So my hope is that we are reaching such levels of valuations in India and in some other emerging markets like Brazil, which are in fact at the low point of the global financial crisis of 2008, where this begins to look interesting for the next three to five years. I'm not saying today or tomorrow this is gonna turn around, but the fact that you are now at levels which are below 2007 and eight highs that we hit in the previous cycle, at least in dollar terms and in inflation adjusted terms in local terms here, I think tells you about the devastation that's taken place in this market. And this is talking about the main indices. If you look at some of the other sort of uh, smaller cap, mid cap indices, the devastation has been even greater. So that is disconcerting at one level, but the good news is the fact that we are possibly getting to levels now which typically mark the start of a longer term uptrend because things are so depressed, unlike the United States, which has been on a tear as far as the market's concerned, and has only now, after this correction, returned to its long-term trend. The Indian stock market and emerging markets in general are well below what their long-term trend is. And so therefore, there may be more scope uh, in the next three to five years once this crisis uh, sort of stabilizes. One final question, Ruchit. New York in lockdown, <laughs> the city where you work, India, your home country yes. in virtual lockdown. How are you keeping yourself occupied? <laughs> it's tough, but I think like all of us, we just have to sort of 
learn to cope with it, do the best we can. Uh, but yeah, so we're all working online, as you know, and just trying my best to continue with my passions that I can, which is running, which is my form of meditation. But yeah, so I think that just trying to sort of keep the balance and keep the perspective and also keeping the long-term historical perspective in mind that people have gone through a lot worse. They've gone through wars, they've gone through famines. And uh, I guess all of us in our, at least once in our lifetime, this generation, uh, I guess it's the law of average that you have to see something like uh, something as grim as this. That's just the reality of life. So just keeping that in perspective and retaining your sanity by running and doing the form of meditation that you want uh, until this cloud passes by, I think is the best that we can do. We hope that the cloud passes by sooner rather than later. It's probably the biggest story in a sense, in that sense of our times. Yeah. Uh, but Ruchi Sharma, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for joining us. Do I do this or not? I think this, we is, do the, this. this is the best thing to do in these Thank times. you very much, Ruchi, for joining us. That's it on this special interview, the coronavirus outbreak, the challenge facing India and the world. Thanks for watching. Hello everyone, this is Rahul Kamal here. Hope you enjoyed this video. For the latest news and analysis, like and subscribe the India Today YouTube channel and don't forget to press the bell icon to stay updated.